So I'd like to actually make a disclosure and state that our study was funded with a $5,000 grant through our oncology section of the American Physical Therapy Association. We do have an HIV special interest group, and we were very excited to move into the domain of the use of yoga for management of chronic pain with patients living with HIV disease. Clearly, as discussed by Darth Vader over there, who took away those slides, who snuck in to my slide deck, um, this is going to be a very quick overview. And I think what's, uh, once again, from our morning uh, keynote speaker uh, to all through the theme, this issue of chronic pain has its uh, significant numbers in the research from 39 to 55 percent. This concurrent psychiatric illness also is um, individuals that have concurrent pain at 40%, and then add to that algorithm substance abuse, which increases higher pain sensitivity and disruption of activities of daily living. Furthermore, we know that it reduces quality of life and as we've seen across the board in our discussions today, that it is often underestimated and undertreated. And our individuals living with HIV disease across the spectrum are less likely with chronic pain to be adherent to antiretroviral therapies. So there's a multifactorial etiology as we talked uh, today, direct HIV infection, inflammatory intermediaries, uh, in the immune um, activation, side effects of uh, treatment, as well as neurologic mechanisms, the comorbidities and multimorbidities, the various opportunistic infections, psychosocial influences, prescription opioid misuse and heroin use, and of course the cultural, gender, and ethnic differences in perception and expression of pain syndromes. So as Kyle presented, he gave a wonderful algorithm of the intersection of the types of chronic pain, uh, that being nociceptive, inflammatory, and neuropathic that really brings it home to our discussion this afternoon as it relates to peripheral neuropathy syndrome specifically. Talking about a holistic approach from a psychologically informed perspective, that central sensitization and peripheral sensitization really develop over time that lend itself to the chronicity. Furthermore, as uh, articulated, the issues of aging and frailty, uh, direct um, effects of um, really looking at all of the component parts for people living with chronic pain continue to be perseverative. In addition to this, we also know that pain is independently associated with the increased odds of impairments as it relates to mobility, self-care, as well as usual activities. And if we look at some of these risk factors in the literature, we know that disability associated with chronic pain in general include all of the elements of both physical, psychological, compensation dependency, functional limitations, depression, anxiety, fear avoidance behaviors, and high levels of initial pain alongside poor health. However, individuals living with chronic pain who have HIV are 10 times greater. They have the odds of impaired physical function and disability. Thusly, we're going to hone in and dive a little bit deeper in the area of a specific consideration of a chronic pain syndrome, which includes distal sensory polyneuropathy, which is the most common neurological comorbidity. Obviously, the other aspects of musculoskeletal pain can accompany this, but this specific direct impact on the uh, nerves in the, in the hands and the feet affect between 30 to 60 individuals living uh, with HIV disease. And as described here on the the pictorial here, we see that this really isn't a stocking glove distribution that results in quite a bit of painful night cramps, burning pain, and paresthesias or numbness in the hands and feet. So this clinical presentation can be quite significant, and this is where early detection and early surveillance is key in order to mitigate pain. 
What we know, however, of course, in this management of chronic pain is, as Kyle mentioned this morning, this biopsychosocial approach. We have tried opioids. We have tried quite a bit of extensive pharmacologic agents, and we know of the many side effects of these drug interactions, and then add to the complementary drug-herb interactions and supplements to also mitigate pain, and we can see quite a bit of challenges as it relates to the side effects of the many medications that individuals use to manage neuropathy. Thus, we open up our conversation on the use of yoga for individuals with HIV-related neuropathy. Thank you, Mary Lou. Dave, take it away. It's always hard to follow Mary Lou. <laughs> But last night at the Realize reception, I didn't even try. That, I was just like, stay in your seat, Dave. Don't even try to follow that. Uh, but anyway, I um, want to talk about a case series that we did. There is a, a dearth of evidence on non-pharmacological management of chronic pain in people living with HIV. Uh, as Dr. Harding mentioned earlier this morning, of the randomized controlled trials on self-management programs for people living with HIV, only a few of them have included pain as an outcome. There is a, lot, a larger body of literature on exercise for living for people living with HIV, uh, as summarized by Kelly and Stephanie and in their co-authors in their widely recognized systematic reviews. But in those exercise studies, pain is not consistently included as an outcome. So uh, we're not aware of any randomized controlled trials that used yoga as an intervention to manage chronic pain in people living with HIV. So as a step toward that, we did this case series that I'm going to share with you today. Uh, these were individuals who were adults uh, HIV positive with a concurrent diagnosis of distal sensory polyneuropathy in the feet with a baseline pain of at least 4 out of 10 or higher and on stable um, management of their HIV disease with, with ART as well as stable management pharma, pharmacologically of their pain. The yoga intervention was four weeks, twice weekly classes. Of, it was an integrated yoga program that included philosophy, breathing exercises, 50 minutes of practice of postures with emphasis on lower extremity balance, stretching, and stability, strengthening, as well as meditation, uh, relaxation, and home practice on non-class days. We had a number of outcomes, including the brief pain inventory, quality of life instrument, the MOS HIV, the lower extremity functional scale, self-reported disability was measured with the HUDAS. We measured lower extremity strength with the five times sit to stand test, balance with the multi-directional reach test, endurance with the six minute walk test, and we also captured gait right data to look at temporal and spatial characteristics of gait. The three individuals in the case series were all middle-aged men, uh, HIV positive ranging from 15 years to 30 years with a diagnosis of distal sensory neuropathy ranging from 7 years to 15 years. I'm going to start with one of the most compelling results that was consistent across all three individuals. Most of the outcomes were not consistent across all three individuals. Most of the outcomes were scattered like buckshot all over the place. But in all three individuals, pain-related quality of life improved by greater than 10% after four weeks of yoga. In fact, it actually it, it virtually doubled if you kind of look at the trajectory of pain improvement in pain-related quality of life after the four weeks of yoga. Interestingly, the um, more rigid measurements of pain intensity and pain interference did not consistently improve across individuals. Only case two had a meaningful decrease in pain severity and pain interference. And when you look at those three lines, each individual line represents an individual person and what happened with their pain-related quality of life, um, with the middle mark being post-intervention. So this was an interesting finding, and what I think our conclusion from this was that the yoga program wasn't necessarily effective in reducing the perception of pain, right, the pain intensity, yet everybody felt that it, their pain-related quality of life was substantially better. So perhaps they learned to cope with their pain more effectively and live with it without it being less of an emotional or psychological burden. Um, 
physical health quality of life, again, kind of inconsistent results there. Mental health quality of life, inconsistent results with uh, two people improving after the yoga intervention. Lower extremity functional scale, one person improving after four weeks of yoga, and then another person improving actually by the time of follow-up. So these were more inconsistent. The six-minute walk test, one individual had improved endurance. These show uh, improvements in balance. In two of the cases, there was one case with no improvement in balance. The solid circle is their baseline ability to reach and how far they were able to reach. And as you can see by the dotted circle in case two, both in the forward, backward, left and right reach directions, they had improved limits of stability in all directions after yoga. And in case three, in the left, right directions after four weeks of yoga. Um, and gait parameters improved as well. Interestingly, in all three cases, there were improvements in stride length, walking velocity, and double limb support time. Now, this, we found this particularly interesting because the yoga protocol did not involve any practice of walking or gait activities. Yet, all of the subjects had Im meaningful improvements in these rather important markers, temporal and spatial characteristics of gait. And we think it was probably due to the fact that if their lower extremity flexibility improved, if their balance improved, if their strength improved, that that then ha somehow segued into some improvement in their temporal and spatial characteristics of gait. So our conclusions are that the yoga program was safe and feasible for all three of the participants. We had no adverse events. The, all three participants in a uh, satisfaction survey that's not reported on these slides viewed it as a highly favorable experience. And uh, the outcomes, although they were inconsistent across the cases, uh, all experienced improvements in pain-related quality of life, as well as certain gait characteristics. Thank you very much.